Good evening, everyone. It's Bible study time, but tonight we're going to do something a little different. It's Pentecost season, and so we're going to re-air Bishop Thomas's sermon from Sunday, which was about Pentecost. Pentecost is when God took the disciples to another level, and Bishop will be preaching on Pentecost until Pentecost Sunday, which is next Sunday. We'll also be baptizing on Pentecost Sunday. So if you'd like to get baptized, don't forget to go to churchcenter.com and register today. Now let's get ready for the word. I am so satisfied. Can you nudge somebody close to you and just tell them I'm satisfied? Would you open your Bibles to the Acts of the Apostles? Chapter 1, verse 3. I want to start a series today and preach the first part of it. We're heading toward Pentecost. Pentecost is the fourth Sunday in this month, and it marks the beginning of the church, the beginning of a new community. Nudge somebody and say, a change of culture. And I hope to be preaching us to that change, that change and all the activities we have and do, we're moving toward that change to our new understanding of it this year. Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, verse three. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want to talk as God shall guide today from these words, claiming your next level. You may go to your seat. So glad to have worshiping with us the president of the Isha board of the St. John Baptist Church in Gainesville, Georgia, where Reverend Joshua Thomas is the pastor. Brother Bud, won't you stand? He's the mayor of the square there. So glad to have him worshiping with us today. But I, I want to talk in this series about claiming your next level. Look at somebody and tell them, I need to hear this. Claiming your next level. The 40-day period after the resurrection, 50 days marks Pentecost, but the 40-day period after the resurrection was filled with some amazing encounters with Jesus. The morning out of the resurrection, when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared first to a couple of guys who had left the city of Jerusalem upset at his death and journeyed out toward Emmaus. They invited him to journey with them, this stranger who met them on the road. But when they invited him in the house to eat with them and gave him opportunity to say grace and break bread, when he broke the bread, they understood who he was and knew that Jesus was alive. That night, the night of the resurrection, he just came through a wall, through locked doors, and stood in the midst of his disciples and spoke to them, saying, peace. And a week later, he showed up when Thomas was now in the gathering and said to him, walked over to him and said, put your finger in my nail prints and opened his side and said, put your hand in my side. On another occasion, when the disciples were up in Galilee and had gone fishing, they looked out on the beach, and who should they see but Jesus making breakfast for them on the beach. Simon Peter jumped out of the boat, ran to shore, 
so that he could have a conversation with Jesus about the mistake he made sitting around the fire. When they asked him, did he know Jesus? And he denied him three times. Now, however, they were seeing him in all of his splendor. They were seeing him in his resurrected glory. Nudge somebody and say, get this. Life could no longer harm him. Y'all missed that. He was at a state in a stage when life couldn't hurt him anymore. Somebody said, I wish I was like that. Life had taken its best shot at Jesus and failed. Help me somebody. He was crucified on Friday afternoon. Blood came running down. But early Sunday morning, he triumphantly rose from the dead. And in the words of our mothers and father, he got up with all power in his hand. And for anybody who could believe and accept that revelation, help me somebody, life would never be the same. You've heard me say this, if you can believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. Baby, you can believe God can do anything that needs to happen in your life. If I have a witness, I just need somebody to say, I know that's right. Trisha, the disciples were standing beside the miracle. They were connected to the man they saw die. They were living in a brand new reality. I, I would have pinched myself till the skin was gone. I'd have bit my tongue to make sure I was awake. I'd have slapped myself and called me silly. I, I would have done, because I just would have had to catch, is this real? But once they accepted it as real, they could then begin to expect and anticipate a new chapter in their own lives. I don't want to preempt myself, but let me say this. If you're having a hard time expecting and anticipating a new chapter in your life, it may be because you don't accept the one in Jesus' life. But if you can believe Oh, God, this is what separates the sheep from the goat. If you can believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, then you can expect and anticipate a new chapter in your life. If I'm on anybody in here who knows I'm telling the truth, nudge the person inside you and tell them, I'm going to shout for you. Uh-oh, no, 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 we need to do something else this morning. Nudge the person beside you and say, I'm going to claim this for you. Because by the end of this sermon, you're going to claim it for yourself. I'm going to claim it for you now. Because by the end, you're going to call oh, God, help me say it. You're going to claim this for yourself. A new chapter is about to break in your life. A new season is coming in your life. Pentecost is not on the calendar by accident. A new moment is about to come forth into your space. But you have to be ready for it. You have to be right for it. You have to be in right relationship for it. You have to believe it based on the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. And if God put him in resurrected glory, he's about to give you a new chapter to your story. That is, or this is, what Jesus offers. This is the gift. It ain't a new car and a new house. That, that comes along the journey of being human. What Jesus offers is a new chapter, a new season in your otherwise painful experience. And if I'm preaching to folk who need, want, wish for, or hope that a new season is close to you, then I need you to say, give it to me. Give it to me. 
Mike, he offers us the kingdom of heaven while we embrace and live in the world of mankind. He offers us the throne room of God while we battle crime and murder, racism, sexism, genderism, and oppressive forces. He opens our eyes to show us what we and who we can really be and what we are really working with. He opens our eyes to show us we are not impotent, we are not defeated, we are not pitiful, we are not low on the totem pole, but we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that we are filled with power, that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, that whatsoever we ask in his name, believing, he will accomplish it, that if we open our mouths, he will speak through us. He offers all of that. Luke says, and he appeared for 40 days to cement this thought, this idea, this revelation, in the minds and in the spirits of those that were hearing him. They never, and, and this is the part you gotta get, look at somebody say, get this. Because this jumps the barrier of time. They never knew the moment when he, that would be interrupted by his presence. For 40 days, the Bible says he showed up, but they never knew what day he was coming. They could get up with stank breath. Just look at somebody, don't say nothing. And he show up. They could be driving their car and he show up. They could be sitting at their desk and he show up. He just appeared. But that's what happens for those who've chosen to accept him. He just, if I've got 20 people in church today, who knows he just shows up. He just pops up. No, maybe not in flesh and blood, but in a thought in your head. He just pops up. All of a sudden, your mind is going down a certain street. God, help me preach this thing. All of a sudden, you're starting to think in a certain direction that you weren't thinking the day before. All of a sudden, you're listening to something on the radio, and your mind is gripped to it because it's answering a question that you asked last week about something. All of a sudden, you're walking on the street, and you see something that registers something else, and something else in your brain clicks, and a door to heaven opens and answers start flowing and spirit starts coming. All of a sudden you're standing outside and the gentle breezes begin to talk to your spirit and it's as if voices are whispering in your head that God is with you every step of the way and no good thing will he withhold from you. Whatsoever you ask in his name believing he'll do it for you. Out of nowhere it just happened. I need a hold me still praise in here. I need somebody say, just hold me for a minute. Because baby, I'm about to lose it when I think of how he just pops. I, I don't understand it, Mother McCain. I, I, but he has no schedule for when he appears. He, he just shows up. When the battle's not going good, he just... When my mind is lost and confused, he just, when my enemies and my foes come up against me to eat up my flesh, he, when my money is funny, he, when the hounds of hell are on my case, he, when I am confused and can't talk about it to anybody else, he, Just when I need him most, he just. Ned the person beside to say, you don't understand this baby, but oh, glory, thank you. He just shows up. And when he does, Vernon, he, 
I don't care what problem God solves when he shows up. I need you to do my, my wife sometime when things get good, she'll just go. I need some of y'all just to get one of them moments like this. Because no matter what problem God solves when he just shows up, he also has a word just for you. He never solves a problem without dropping a word. You'll be all right. Didn't I tell you I had this? Keep looking forward. Don't quit. Don't give up. I got your back. We're getting through this. The best is yet to come. It's a new season. It's a new day. You ain't seen nothing yet. Hold on. Hold out. The best is yet to come. I got your back. I got angels watching over you. This is just the first of many things to come. This is the first trouble, but not the last trouble. But just like I took care of you through this one, I'm going to take care of you through the next one. I'm not only solving your problem, I'm speaking a word into your life. Oh, Jesus! I'm not just solving your problem, but I always speak a word into your life. Speaking a word. Somebody got to embrace this truth. He will pop up in your life. And when he does, he'll speak that word that will guide you into your next season. If you don't get anything else, y'all hope you got that. Whatever problem God solves, it is a precursor to letting you know you are getting ready to enter your next season. And if I've got anybody in here who's on the cusp of a next season, I need you to slap five with the person beside and say, I'm claiming this. I don't care who else does not I'm claiming this. I'm claiming this. I'm claiming a new age. I'm claiming a new season. I'm claiming a new moment. I'm claiming a new opportunity. I'm claiming a new life. I'm claiming a new future. I'm claiming new happiness. I'm claiming new joy. I'm claiming new life. I'm claiming new action. I'm claiming new heights. I'm claiming it. God just solved the problem. And when God solves a problem, it becomes a stepping stone so that I can go higher. So I'm claiming higher. I'm claiming better. I'm claiming more. I'm claiming up because the problem he solved is now my footstool. Oh! Woo! He's popping up. And I just came to tell somebody He's been popping up in your space. That's why the enemy has not triumphed over you. That's why your foes have not been victorious. That's, not, that's why when the devil rose up against you, you saw him get behind you. Because the forces of the eternal were lifted to come to your rescue. And what your eyes couldn't see, your spirit could feel. And victory has been yours because you are on your way somewhere. And I need you to declare, I'm getting ready for a brand new season. And I'm claiming this, baby. I'm claiming this. I've been here too long. I'm claiming this. Help me, somebody. Lord. The disciple, y'all sit down a minute. Woo! Let somebody tell me I'm getting ready to go off. If I didn't have the rest of this sermon, I'd tell the organ to go. Because I could dance on that myself. I could dance on a word always spoken with an action. I could dance on the fact that God says, if I made your enemies your footstool, then don't step down, step up.
If I made what you face your footstool, don't back up, go up. Let somebody say, I'm about to take it out in here because you don't know who my enemies and my foes were. You don't know what rose against me. You don't know what has been coming against me. And yet God has given me victory and now says, step up. Uh-oh, uh-oh, as you take your seat, smile at somebody's face and say, I'm claiming my next level, baby. I'm claiming my next level. I'm announcing I'm going there even before I get there. I'm announcing it's mine even before I get the deed. I'm announcing this is what is God has for me. Uh-oh. I hadn't planned to say this, Lance. But I need you to look at the person beside you and put a Cheshire Cat smile on your face and say he's preaching about the will of God concerning me. I'm, whenever God solves a problem in your life, he deposits a word in your spirit. If it's the job, if it's the family, if it's money, whatever it is, whenever he solves a problem, sometimes you, you may not want to hear it, but he's going to give you a word at the same time. He solves a problem for the disciples. Jesus is alive. And this is what resurrected life looks like. Resurrected life is no longer afraid. Resurrected life. Oh! Resurrected life does not get weary of making the next big step because the God of the last big step is still at his back. Resurrected, they're looking at Jesus, who is, they're all in Jerusalem and they're looking at Jesus. Jesus could bit more care about the things they are worried about because he, is showing them the strength that resurrection gives you. Because resurrection affirms for you that the God who is God is greater than anything that would come against you. Your money funny, he'll work it out. Your health bad, he'll work it out. People in your life crazy as a bed bug, he'll work it out. He's got an exterminating system that'll work and clean out your situation. I need about 20 people who know God has fixed some stuff that you did not see how it would be fixed. And now he's saying to you, walk in the belief that is there. They sit. They sit, they sit back, and they listen to Jesus with rapt attention. He's in resurrection glory. And he's saying to them, this is what I'm offering y'all. Not, not when you die, because as you see, I'm alive. This ain't Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, or the widow of Nain's son. I am alive. And I'm offering you this, this same kind of determination, this same kind of awareness while you yet live. That's what I'm coming to offer you. And they're sitting there as if they're at the general's table listening to strategy. And he's giving the commander's intent, saying to them, under no circumstances 
under no circumstances do you fail to be who you are. Nothing. Don't you let anything or anybody cause you to waver in who you are. You are a blood washed, born again, child of God. You are an heir and a joint heir with Jesus. You are your heavenly father's child. Don't you ever mistake and think that the adversary has more power. You can speak things that are not and they will come to pass. God, I need about 20 people in here who can say, I feel it rising in me. I feel it rising. I feel it rising. And then he says this. He looks at him. And then Angie, he speaks the word. He's done the work. They're standing there amazed. 40 days, he's just been popping up. Popping up, just... And they're blown away. And he's advising them, this is what I'm offering you. This guy. And he says to them, this is the way to get it. And then somebody say, I need to hear this part. This is the way to get what I just told you you can have. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John, y'all know John the Baptist. He baptized with water. But baby, in a few days, you gonna have something happen to you like you ain't never known before. And you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on in chapter verse 8 saying, you'll be my witnesses. In you'll be filled with power. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the utmost parts of the world. Because you are about to claim your next level. And let me tell you something. When Jesus tells you about your next level, don't come up with any fake humility. Don't try to dance on some pseudo spirituality. Just be straight up front ghetto and say, I want it. I want everything you have for me. Give it to me. Give me all of it. Don't give me half of it. Don't try to be cute and sophisticated. I don't want it to mess up my hair. I don't want to mess up my shit. Give it to me. Give me every bit of it. I need every drop of it. Baptize me in it. Bathe me in it. Because I want my next level. This is what blows my mind. Jesus says, this is the way to get to your, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait, stay here and wait for the promise, the gift that I promised you. John baptized with water, but after many days, you gonna be filled. I need you to go back to, I need you to stay right here in Jerusalem. I need you to wait until you are filled with the Spirit. Uh-oh. And then watch what God does when he sets you loose. I need somebody to just say, I'm anticipating. Amazing chapter in my life. See, the beauty of it is you can't even conceive what God's going to do in your life. You can't even figure out what God's going to do. But I've come here to preach, declare, and to testify to you that God's got great things in store for you that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, nor hath it entered into the hearts of men what great things God is going to do for you. But I promise you 
you this. What God does in your life is going to make your cup overflow. What God does in your life is going to expand your witness. What God does in your life is going to multiply your influence. What God does in your life is going to bring lives back together. What God does in your life is going to exalt the name of Jesus. What God does in your life is going to plant you in new positions. What God does in your life is going to bring joy into your spirit. I need somebody who knows you've been looking for joy. You've been trying to find not intermittent joy. Some of you have joy like intermittent fasting. You have joy on two days a week. But do you know in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And what God is offering you is not a two day a week experience of joy. But God plans to walk with you in the next dimension of your life in such a way that at any moment you can break out in a doxology. You can go to shouting in a hallelujah. You can look back over where you've come from. Do I have anybody here who's waiting for a period of perpetual praise when you serve and you praise, when you learn and you praise, when you give and you praise, when you witness and you praise? Do I have anybody who's looking for a life of communion with God that has you so connected that every time you open your mouth, you will bless the name of the Lord. I can't tarry too long. My time is almost up. I can't tarry too. The first thing he says, this is the first thing that, 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 that y'all sit down a minute. You may not jump up no more. First thing he says, he looks at them after he says, do not, and he says it emphatically. He doesn't just say, now don't y'all leave the room here. You know, he's trying to tell them, this is, this is the path to your next level. You see it in front of you, manifested. I am the personification of your next level, he says. My resurrected form is the explanation of everything I did in the flesh. What the rest of you didn't see on the Mount of Transfiguration when I was transfigured and Moses and Elijah with, with me, all of you are now seeing because I am resurrected. So you are seeing the essence of who I really am. When I healed the sick, when I raised the dead, when I, when I taught with such amazing clarity, when I did miracles, now you understand where it came from. This is the source of everything I have been. What you couldn't understand then, you can now look at and understand. What a textbook couldn't teach you, I am personifying in front of you. You all were confused when I did miracles. Now you see miracle in front of you. You couldn't understand why I prayed. Now you see what prayer does. I am the living embodiment now. My resurrected form is the explanation for everything you were confused about that you saw me do. And I'm saying to you, this is what I'm offering you. You can be like me. If you accept my father on the same level I accepted him, then everything that he does through me, he can and will do through you. <laughs> Woo! But in order for this to happen, the first step in the process, the first step, and, and if you can't follow direction. Can y'all tarry with me for 30 seconds? It's amazing how grown people can get huffy about acting more immature than children. What do you mean, preacher? That's a lot of words to say what? On the little, JD helped me with this some years ago. On the little children's report card in preschool, 
and maybe up through kindergarten, they will, add, they will say your child can play good or he, can, he's got, he or she has good motor skills. But then there are, other, there are two other little areas on there, on the children's report card. Nudge somebody and say, do you know what they are? Of course they don't know. Even if, and if their children are in elementary school, they pay, or in the kindergarten and pre-K, they pay great attention to it. These are the two categories. One follows directions, and the second works well with others. And more grown folk get messed up in life because they simply can't follow directions. Y'all say, it's, it's, you know, you hear that little low moment. But it's the truth. Little children, the child will sit in the class. What do you mean? My child doesn't. No, your child doesn't follow. I'm going to work on that. When I get home, I'm going to work on that with them. They're going to learn to follow directions. They don't work well with others. We're going to work on, you know, they are an only child. And, and so I, I'm going to work on that with them so that they, but when they get, but by the time of the third grade, that's off the report card. But the lesson has not been learned. How to follow. Jesus says you'll never get to the next level if you're still arrogant enough to believe you don't need to follow direction. <laughs> Nudge somebody and tell them there are directions to follow. The worst mistakes, there, there are some stores I will not buy things from because I, I can't follow directions well and and some of you know there's stuff you put together i remember i had billy curtis and carl solomon and uh some others helped me put together my little children's play set uh, and i had to go away i made sure it was the time i was leaving so that they could all work and put together billy called me back i said how'd it go he said well it almost went good that's what you mean he said we put it together backwards I said, how do y'all put a house together backward? He said, easy, we didn't follow the direction. <laughs> he said, then we had to go back and do it according to the directions. Jesus said, if you want this next level of your life, you got to follow the directions. I've already given you the intro. I want to give you the first direction. Do not leave Jerusalem. Uh-oh, what, 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 what's that mean? That's, that's back there. Do not... The New American Commentary looks at the construction of that verse and concludes this is what it really means. It doesn't mean don't leave Jerusalem, do not depart from Jerusalem. Not somebody say he's coming down your street with this. What it really says is stop departing from Jerusalem. Stop going and coming to Jerusalem. Stay right where you are. Quit trying to have the world and the house at the same time. Uh-oh, it's getting real quiet now. Quit trying to be Miss Thang and Miss Sanctified at the same time. Quit trying to have one foot in the world and one foot in the house. You've got to stay right here in Jerusalem. Nudge somebody and tell them their next level is about being in Jerusalem. This is a powerful word. When we read the words here and hear Jesus telling them to stay put, he's saying more than just that. He's saying that this in the season of Pentecost, in this season when God is working in our lives, we have to remember to stay put where he has put us. You can't be trying the world and God at the same time. See, remember, Jesus was crucified. They're going back and forth. Remember, they left Jerusalem. The two men from Emmaus left because they couldn't handle it. They left. The disciples were up in Galilee. They had gone back to fishing, and Jesus met them on the beach. Jesus says, now, in this critical moment in your life, this is not the season to be entertaining the voice of the world in your head. This is not the season to be listening to messy folk who want to mess up your life trying to tell you they're going to bless you you. 
God, somebody needs to hear what I'm saying. Do not depart from Jerusalem. Stay put. You can't keep dabbling in two different worlds. You have to stay where God has you to stay. Let somebody say, get this. Because, uh-oh, let me say this right. He says, stop going and coming. Stop, stop being in church on Sunday and then trying to hang and do all the other stuff through the week. He said, no, no, you're missing this. You are sitting beside the miracle that overcomes life. You are sitting beside the miracle that life took its best shot at and lost. So why are you still trying to believe life has something better for you? That God is not going to offer you the best stuff that he has. That God is going to give you second best. You need to stop and consider who woke you up this morning. Who filled you with power and grace. Who sustains you. You've got to keep in Jerusalem. Because, uh oh, uh oh. You have to make a choice. Warren, this is the part people have to get. You have to finally make a choice between anxiety that the world offers or the adventure that God is offering. What do you mean, preacher? Aren't some of you tired of being miserable? I know you don't want to do this, so just do this. Tired of it because the world is offering you something. He says, stop going and coming. You get upset, so you go over here. I'm going, where you go? I'm going to get drunk tonight. This is the new thing. I'm going to smoke cannabis. That's weed, baby. I was in a meeting a few weeks ago, and somebody was talking about legalizing cannabis and whatever, and I said to them, I said, can I ask one question? They said, yes, what's your question? I said, well, you know, I went to school in the 70s. Then I had to correct myself, Gregory. I said, the 60s. And back then, we called it weed. I said, is this weed that you all just legalized different from the weed that was illegal two weeks ago? Because, baby, I know a lot of people dead and in jail because of that weed. All the world offers you is that which will produce anxiety. Anxiety is a fear of the future. How things gonna work out? How, how am I gonna make it through this? How am I gonna get through this? Anytime you are living there, you're outside of Jerusalem. Anytime you are living in the fear, you are outside of Jerusalem. When you're in Jerusalem, God is offering you an adventure. And instead of fighting the fear that comes with anxiety. You are growing the faith that comes with your future. You start seeing things that you ain't never seen before. You start believing possibilities you haven't even heard of before. I wish I had somebody in here who's starting to see possibilities that two weeks ago, two months ago, were not even on the scene. Two years ago, were not even in your life. And all of a sudden, you are caught up on these possibilities. You're starting to build your life around these possibilities. Am I talking to anybody who can now start holding your head up? See, the world will have you walking with your head down. Why? You're looking down because you don't want to be involved. You want to throw all this stuff through your head. But your mind can't figure out your future. Only your faith can walk you into your future. God, I need about five people in here who understand that faith is the only thing that can help you handle your future. And when you keep your hand in God's hand, when you realize I cannot keep going and coming, I cannot keep bouncing this ball, I've got to stay in Jerusalem. Up. Wait a minute, nudge somebody and say, you got to stay in Jerusalem. Because Angie, Jerusalem represents faith for my future. And whenever you are caught up in your anxiety, whenever you find out, I just don't know how it's going to work. I just don't know what's going to happen. I just, I just don't. You've left Jerusalem. 
How many of you know there have been times you sat on the side of the bed so confused and you started talking to God and God started clearing up your mind, giving you a sense, and ain't nothing changed. Ain't nothing changed, but you change. All of a sudden, you started feeling like I can handle this. I'm going to be all right. And then you do the great. Oh. I need somebody just to go, huh. And look at the person beside and say, God got something for me. I ain't standing back here worrying about what I'm leaving, worrying about what I'm dealing with, worrying about what's behind me. That door is shut. Oh, God, help me say it right. That door is closing. And I am not going to put my foot in it to stop it. In fact, I'm going to walk through the door and move on to the next chapter of my life. If I've got five people ready for the next chapter, look at somebody and say, faith it forward. Faith it forward. Faith it forward. But wait a minute. Go back to Jerusalem. You got to get this. Jerusalem represented two things. Jerusalem was the place where religion, their organized religion was. They were Jews. This was the center of their religious experience. This was historically a special place. Like the church historically plays a special place in their lives. But this is the, this is the big one. None of the disciples except Judas were from the south from where Jerusalem is. Now, you and I want to go see the World Trade Center, the new one, or go to the UN building. We just get in the car, get on Amtrak, and go. They didn't do that then. There was no Amtrak. There were no electric vehicles. You got there like this. So if somebody told me, ladies, how many of you have on nice shoes today. Raise your hand if you have on nice shoes. And somebody says, we going to B. Smith's today down in Washington and we're going to walk. <laughs> Are those shoes on your feet making the journey? No, well, let me help you. Are those feet in those shoes <laughs> making the journey? How many of you say no way? You ain't going, no. So most of the folk, most of the Jews had not frequented Jerusalem. They knew its specialness, but they didn't go regular. Every now and then somebody might make the pilgrimage to get to Jerusalem for one of the high holy days, but it was not the place they went regularly. So most of them had an image in their mind of what Jerusalem was like and supposed to be like. They didn't get there to experience it, so they created the experience in their mind. So these disciples had only been to Jerusalem on the regular with Jesus. Y'all still ain't got it. And when Jesus went to Jerusalem, nobody moved over and gave him a seat. When Jesus went to Jerusalem, people treated him terrible. In fact, their memory of Jerusalem, their last memory, was Jesus being killed. Y'all still ain't getting it. Jerusalem, for them, was the place of church hurt. You know what somebody said? Oh, I never thought of it that way. For the disciples, he says, don't leave Jerusalem. Stay in the place where I've been hurt. Oh, God, it's getting quiet now. Because some of y'all know people with church hurt. Not somebody and say, I know about church hurt. Jesus was their teacher, their master. And what happened to him? He's crucified. He's killed. And now... Jesus is saying to them, I want y'all to stay here. No, Jesus. I ain't staying here where the deacons are mean. My mama died and they didn't call me. My gas and electric was about to be turned off. 
And them sedated folk down there almost wanted to make me write my name, social security, and government address just to get $25. I, I, I don't see why you saying stay there. Somebody on the choir tried to hit on me. And after they hit on me, I had to live with it for 20 years. Hit it one more time there. <laughs> you telling me don't leave here? You telling me I got to stay? In, and, and we're living in a day and age when people will tell you, I don't go back to, I was hurt at church. I've been hurt at church. I'm not minimizing, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it clear in a minute. I got to tell you one thing. I don't know too many places I've been. I ain't been hurt. I've been hurt at the market. I've been hurt in a store. I, I, I've been hurt at work. I, I've been hurt at home. C can, I, can I get somebody? So church hurt is no unique hurt in the sense it stands as a hurt. That nobody, no, we are always hurt. And I need some African American people to say, who know, you know what hurt look like. But Jesus says, I know you had a special understanding in your mind about what this place ought to be. And you didn't see it to be that way and you were hurt. And now you're talking about, I can't go back because the place does not match up with my perception of the place. But the problem is your perception of the place is wrong. You are thinking the place is the people, but this is the house where God's name is kept. This is where you will find God. And when you find God, you will find your next chapter. I don't want you to leave even though you've been hurt here in Jerusalem because your deliverance is going to be here. You're going to be hurt in a lot of places but I've got to put you in the place where you can get the healing to match any hurt that you face in any place. Wait a minute. Let, 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 me, let me just say this then I'm done. When I was in seminary when I was in seminary, I, I, I went to Howard University for seminary, and they assigned me to go to a church to work in. It, it was a, a very um, high church. Oh, yes, we long, long, long. Nobody ever shouted, ever, ever. In fact, nobody ever said amen. It was a cough. I thought it was an amen once, but it was just a cough. I sat on the pulpit. We didn't have cell phones to play on while we were in church. So I just sat on the pulpit and said, Lord, deliver me. Please, please deliver me. And one Sunday after service, because service was only an hour, because, you know, I know a lot of people say, why the new psalmist service an hour? The best TV shows are two hours. That's all right. Um, <laughs> and seldom do I go to a movie and pay $8 for an hour. So I, I had gone to a church around the corner, to a Baptist church, and I heard the music as I parked my car. I had a Mustang. I parked my Mustang. I got out my little church clothes. I was young, so I huffed on up the steps. Because, you know, in those days, all churches went up. So I, I don't know how old people got in them, but I just huffed on up the steps. I opened the door. And, you know, I had come from church, so I was a little churchy. I understood church. I slid in, and I sat on the back row. You know, you don't want to be presumptuous and be moving on. Can you move over, please? No. I sat on the back row, first seat. Usher come over to me. You ain't supposed to sit here. You're nobody. And see, see, I was a new, I don't even know if I had preached my initial sermon yet, but I was new to, to being up front in church. So this woman hollering at me, is resurrecting, you know, language patterns that I had sought to closet. Any of y'all got patterns like that, you know? I was praying I didn't cuss, but you know, I was, she, she come basing at me. You ain't supposed to be sitting here. You don't sit on this back row. 
and she getting loud and people doing this. <laughs> I'm remembering my mother and father's trainer. Don't you make us look bad. Cause I'm about ready to blast her. Get up out of this seat. I felt my face quiver. I ain't had no collar. I just had a white shirt and a little towel on. I was about 23. I got on up. She didn't even show me another seat. I got up, I went to my other seat, and I sat down. Was I mad? Oh. Oh, the levels of mad that I had reached were not on the Richter scale. If the person seated beside me when I sat down had done this, it would have been over. <laughs> I was tempted to huff up and march out of and throw my hands up. You know, do the whole nine yards. Holy Spirit says, sit here. I stood here, I sat there, choir starts singing, choir was good, it was real good, that old bat sitting behind me, <laughs> y'all know y'all think like this, if I got anybody who been where I am just they got to sing in the first selection. In those days, they sang an A and a B selection. By the time they got to the B, I'm feeling like this. The preacher got to preaching and started preaching about something I had been dealing with that morning driving to that dead church. And I found myself sitting on the edge of the seat, listening. Then the choir wrapped it all up. Then the service was over and the people on my road were shaking my hand, saying good morning and whatever. And the Lord helped speak to me as I was leaving. He said, see, that woman was an usher in the church, but she wasn't an usher in the Lord's house. And sometimes we encounter people who are in the church, but they're not in the Lord's family. And the Lord said, now get this, get ready to write this down. The Lord said, don't judge Jesus by what his disciples do. Don't put me in the same category as sister so-and-so who rolls her eyes at you. Don't put me in the same category as somebody who didn't say the right thing for you. No, I'm the one who'll make up your dying bed. I'm the one who'll dry your tears. I'm the one who'll speak into your spirit. Do I have anybody in here who know that you've been hurt even in New Psalmist, but you bring your little self back here, not because of Tom, Dick, and Harry, but because the Lord has a mysterious way of dealing with your spirit. Don't you let the devil mess your mind up with I've been hurt come back and get healed let God bless your life God I need somebody to get where I'm coming from that's the person beside you and tell them just stay put God you didn't say it like you mean it say stay put because God's got something for you here God's gonna speak into your life here God's gonna prepare you for your next journey here God's gonna open doors that nobody can shut. God's gonna change your mind. God's gonna bless your life. God's gonna fix your spirit. So go back, stay right in Jerusalem. Even though some folk don't like you, keep on praising him. Even though some folk don't speak to you, keep on raising your hand and saying, Father, I stretch my hand to thee no other help I know look at somebody and say I ain't going nowhere I'm staying with the Lord's church the church has brought me this far the church has kept me this long the church has opened doors for me when the saints go to worship 
God, I need somebody to declare when the saints go to worship, we forget about all the other stuff and say, I will bless the name of the Lord. This is how I get ready for my next chapter. I'm done. You've been hurt in Jerusalem. You've been hurt in Jerusalem. But go back there anyhow. Because I'm going to heal you of your hurts. I'm going to heal you in Jerusalem. I want everybody to stand. When the saints go up to worship, that's when deliverance. I remember that day in my experience just like it was yesterday. God said, that person is an usher in the church. They're not an usher in the Lord's house. The person that shook my hand and said, how you doing this morning? We're so glad to have you. That was an usher in the Lord's house. The person who came up to me and said, glad to see you today. That's who God wanted. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my next level over somebody who ain't even on their first one. Somebody missed that. I'm going to lose my next level over somebody who's not even on their first level. No, baby. God's going to send somebody else to me who's going to help me get to where I need to go. I got a feeling there's somebody here this morning who needs the Lord in their life. You've come to New Psalmist today. But God is telling me to tell you that this is the moment you need to walk on down this aisle. Don't, don't, don't leave here today without Christ in your life. This is the place to stay because he's got your next level all mapped out right here. Don't let the world fill you with anxiety. Let the Lord fill you with adventure. What is next in store for me? Where is God taking me now? I can't speak for anybody else. But God has raised up the best people in my life. And you know where they are? In Jerusalem. Do I, can I see the hands of folk who know? God has put some of the best people in your life right here in Jerusalem. Are there some folk who don't like you? Yes, but guess what? There's some who don't like me either. But I ain't going to lose sleep over that. Because when we, we welcome him in, oh, he does some major things. While every head is bowed, every eye closed. If you don't have Christ in your life, maybe you're not a member of a church anywhere. You say, I came to church today for whatever reason. But you're not a member of a church Maybe you've never been baptized. You've never accepted this miracle of the resurrected Christ in your life. And you're saying, Pastor, I need somebody praying for me. While every head is bowed, every eye closed, I want you just to raise your hand. I'm the only person looking out. And I want you to know I'm going to be the one praying for you. Just raise your hand wherever you are. If you say, I need somebody praying for me, Pastor. I don't have a church home. I'm not a member of a church. Just raise your hand up. Because I want to pray for you that God will change and bless your life. I don't know about anybody else, but I feel his presence. God bless you in the back. Is there another? Just keep your hand up a moment. Is there another? Just raise your hand. Won't you move leaders? Just I want to be praying for you that God will move in your life. I want to say to you, sister, I want to say to you, brother, all the way in the back, I want to tell you, one day I came to church and I wasn't a member of anybody's church. And I heard a preacher tell me no matter how good my life was, Jesus Christ could make it better. I walked down the aisle and he changed, Jesus changed my life. 
Oh, praise God, somebody's walking. If there's another, you come on. I want to tell you, he'll change your life. He'll change your life. Oh, yes, we welcome you in, God. Praise God, praise God. Won't you stand with a vow? We welcome you in, praise God. Won't you stand with a joy? Praise God. Is there another? Come on, come on, come on, come on. It's Mother's Day. It's a day to get right. You're the king and you're invited. You're invited to come in. We welcome you in. Come on and try it. Oh, we welcome you in. You are welcome. You are welcome. You're the king and you're invited to come in. She wants you come. You're the king. You're invited. Next Sunday, next Sunday, I'm going to continue this theme, claiming your next level. Step one, stop coming and going. Stop coming and going. Little church this week. Maybe in another month I'll be back. I'll go back. You don't have to come to New Psalms, but you got to keep you got to stay in Jerusalem. You'll never get to your next level coming and going. Can't live on hurt. You got to focus on healing. God has the people in the place for your healing, for your healing, for your healing. Next week, I'm going to move it to the next thing. And wait, and wait. Last week, for the promise of the Father. We're getting ready to go home. It's Mother's Day. Go home and treat Mama good. If your mother's out of town or whatever, give her a call. Some of you say, well, my relationship's not that good. You do what's right. Leave it right there. Thank the person who brought you into this world for giving you the hope you have right now. And live today and get ready. Changes are coming in your life. If I have anybody who believes changes are coming in your life, raise that hand. Next Sunday, where will you be? In church. Those of you who are not members of New Psalmist, you're members somewhere else, where will you be? in church those of you who came to church with mama and ain't a member nobody church where will you be in church in jerusalem because that's critical for your next chapter the lord bless you the lord keep you the lord lift up the light of his countenance round about you oh praise god somebody else has walked give him a hand walk him on in peace Give my hand, Anthony. Give my hand. Two more brothers. New members ministry. Come on and take them with me. Amen. Right before the benediction, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance round about you. And the Lord give you peace. Now go out and start claiming your next level. Shake somebody's hand. You're the king and you're invited to